So welcome everybody to the webinar. I'm Troy Lund. I'm at the University of Minnesota. Uh, today's webinar is on hematopoietic stem cell transplantation. Uh, we'll talk about the general aspects of transplant as well as specific aspects as it relates to cerebral ALD. Uh, I'm one of the transplanters here at the university and I've had a long-standing interest in rare diseases uh, with uh, ALD being probably the most common of the rare diseases that I see. So the information services provided by ALD Connect are for information purposes only. They're not intended to be substitutes for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. If you or a family member are ill or suspect that you or a family member are ill, seek professional medical attention immediately. ALD Connect does not recommend or endorse any specific physician's treatments, procedures, or products, even though they may be mentioned on this site. And please note that participation in this webinar is completely voluntary and that the webinar will be recorded and may be available for rebroadcast at a later time. So first I want to just touch on uh, the history of transplant uh, as we know it. Uh, the first uh, syngeneic or autologous transplants uh, were performed in 1958-1959. Autologous transplants are giving a person's bone marrow back to them, so they're self-transplants. Syngeneic involves the use of uh, genetically identical twins, and some of those transplants were performed uh, before 1960, so from twin to twin. The first allogeneic transplants, those would be between people that are not related, uh, were not successful in those early uh, years, and actually took uh, more than 10 years to figure out why. Transplants were typically reserved for terminally ill patients. Uh, there was no typing uh, of the tissues. There was no matching at that point in time, which is why only autologous or syngeneic transplants worked. Any time you infused marrow from an unrelated person, that the recipient generally died of graft-versus-host disease, because again, there was no matching performed. In about 54, we recognized that there are proteins on the cell surface of all cells called HL, uh, human leukocyte antigens, or HLA, um, and early studies in dogs showed that we actually had to match these proteins between donor and recipient. And by the 1960s, some of these proteins uh, were defined. They have names. They're very simple. They're HLA-A, B, and we have one called DR and we put numbers on all the different proteins, which I'll tell you about in a minute. And those have to be matched between the donor and the recipient for the transplant to engraft. So when did we start doing allogeneic transplants? That is a transplant from somebody uh, not self and not an identical twin. So that would be a sibling transplant or it would be an unrelated person transplant. Well, it turns out the first related allogeneic transplant using bone marrow was performed at the University of Minnesota. It was performed in 1968 by Robert A. Good. The first successful unrelated bone marrow transplant was performed in 1973. It was a child with uh, immunodeficiency. It was done at Memorial Sloan Kettering. And in fact, the child in 1968 at the University of Minnesota also had immunodeficiency. And here's the uh, first uh, recipient in the high chair, and the donor was his sister who's feeding him there. Uh, that uh, transplant was successful. The sister cells engrafted, and he did well. Uh, they weren't a perfect match, but uh, he engrafted anyway. And the uh, young man now who's in his 40s uh, comes back to clinic still every year and uh, is doing well and healthy. So what are the basic principles of transplant? Essentially these have not changed that much. You have to deliver high doses of chemotherapy agents, plus minus radiation, even though for diseases such as adrenal leukodystrophy and other non-cancer diseases we no longer use radiation. And the chemotherapy itself obliterates the bone marrow uh, 
that's currently in, play, play, in place and it also immunosuppresses the patient. And this allows for us to replace the abnormally functioned marrow with healthy donor marrow cells or in cases of cord blood transplants would be healthy cord blood cells. So it's still done with high dose chemotherapy essentially. So again, the recipient then becomes a chimera. And so this is a, Greek, a mythical Greek beast that's part lion, part goat, part uh, snake. It's an individual who has all their own cells as themselves, but their marrow then switches over to the donor. Now the marrow gives rise to red blood cells, platelets, leukocytes, lymphocytes, monocytes, macrophages, uh, and there are perhaps even some glial cells in the brain that are donor. And these, this may be important for adrenal leukodystrophy. So all those blood-derived cells then become donor, but things like skin, liver, lungs, heart, those remain recipient. Um, and this, then the, uh, the donor, the recipient then is known as a chimera. Uh, so essentially two individuals making them up. The most common question I get is, will the blood type change? Yes, the blood type does change to the donor's blood type. Uh, that occurs about six months post-transplant. What do we use transplant for? Uh, commonly, it's used for neoplastic diseases. Myeloid leukemia, lymphoid leukemia, chronic myeloid leukemia, MDS, lymphoma, childhood cancers like neuroblastoma and other solid tumors. We use it for hematopoietic disorders, so aplastic anemia, dyskeratosis congenita, Fanconi anemia, there are other exotic diseases like PNH, diamond black fan anemia, Schwachmann diamond anemia, HLH thalassemia, um, sickle cell disease. Uh, all these disorders are, uh, transplant is used in all these disorders to correct the underlying problem. We also use it in immunodeficiency states, such as uh, severe combined immunodeficiency and related disorders like what's called Aldrich syndrome. And as I remind you, the first transplants performed uh, in the world were done for skin. We also use it for genetic diseases. In, these, in this case, the transplant provides a normally functioned cell and or a cellular source for the deficient enzyme or protein. Most commonly, we use it for mucopolysaccharidosis, like Hurler disease, in which you have a deficiency of alpha iduronidase in your cells. Uh, and we can provide healthy, normal donor marrow cells that would provide that cellular product that's missing. Um, we use an osteopetrosis, where the transplant is a source of osteoclasts uh, and can virtually uh, correct the, the entire disease of osteopetrosis. We use it in adrenal dystrophy as well. Uh, but how the transplant functions, which I'll talk about at the end, is still not quite clear to us, even after 20 to 30 years of doing transplants for ALD. It provides certainly an anti-inflammatory effect. There are probably donor-derived microglia that get into uh, the boys' heads and provide some um, uh, paroxysom normal paroxysmal function. Uh, there also may be modulation of the immune system. Uh, as you get rid of the old immune system and replace it with a new one, um, this may also contribute to the stabilization with ALD. Other diseases like MLD also provide a missing provide a missing enzyme that is absent in the condition. So it's aerosulfatase for MLD. We also do transplants for some skin disorders like dystrophic EBE, dystrophic epidermolysis bullosa, where you're missing collagen seven and the, after you're undergoing transplant, there may be some restoration of collagen 7 and healing the skin. So it's not always cancer that gets transplanted. To remind you about the types of transplant, again, syngeneic or genetically, genetically identical twins, autologous, so that would be your own cells, and then allogeneic, which would be uh, a donor that is not yourself or not your twin. So a brother or sister would be a related person. A, or you could have an unrelated person out in the community. We have the, re, the brother and sister is generally a perfect match to the recipient because they re, are related to you. Though if you use somebody on the community, you may have a very high level match, uh, but you also have levels of mismatch. And if you use an unrelated donor, we typically try to get the highest matched donor as possible. 
Then there are source and sources of cells include marrow, include peripheral blood mobilized stem cells, and include core blood these days. Those are the three main sources. Uh, other sources being pursued in the laboratory, but still these are st the three main sources. So let's talk about the unrelated match. <clears throat> So we have lots of registries of HLA-typed people around the country and around the world. They were first established in St. Paul, Minnesota, as well as Milwaukee, Seattle, and Iowa City. Uh, those registries are maintained today. The National Marrow Donor Program was established in 1986. It was housed in St. Paul Regional Blood Services, provides all the information on HLA matching uh, to try to match donors to potential recipients. The first NMDP facilitated transplant was in December 1987. So where's the NM, where, are they, where are the facilities that use NMDP? The network is shown here in the map of the United States. Obviously, the center is here in St. Paul, Minnesota for coordination, but there's a variety of cord blood banks, donor centers, and transplant centers all over the United States, uh, most heavily on the East Coast, but generally from, from coast to coast, uh, including Puerto Rico, has a donor center. In the NMDP, the number of adult donors has been growing steadily since 1988. As of 2014, we have nearly 12.5 million adults on the donor registry. The right NMTP also helps us with cord blood matching. Uh, the cord blood units in Be the Match is uh, roughly 210,000 by 2014. Though there are other cord blood um, unit uh, cord blood banks out there, and there's potentially a lot more uh, units available for matching. Uh, but this is just what is listed with the NMDP. And generally our search coordinators fax us to the other banks as well. Let's talk a little bit more about this matching since it tends to be a, a complicated point and a point of confusion for a lot of people. These proteins are, are all coded for on one chromosome essentially, these HLA proteins. We don't call it HLA when we talk about the chromosome. Of course, we have to change the name and we call it MHC, Major Histocompatibility Complex. It's all on chromosome 6. And you can see the region uh, on the screen here. And the HLA proteins I told you about are the A, the B, and the C, and then there's another one, DR. We pay most attention to A, B, and DR, but in some regards we might look at the other ones, C, DQ and DP for various reasons, which I won't go into. But these are the proteins that we're trying to match, essentially, when we're talking about matching. What they do, what these proteins do in the body, they're essentially for controlling the immune system. They bind to present proteins to your T cells and they control if your immune system reacts against you or reacts against something foreign. So that's why they play such a crucial role in transplant. So again, the proteins, we'll call it, we'll, the focus will be on protein A, B, there are other ones, and there's also DR. This is the cell membrane, this is the inside of the cell, and the protein literally sits here on the cell surface and presents uh, various proteins and foreign, uh, or various foreign proteins to T cells, and the body decides whether or not to attack that protein and mount the immune response or not. In another way of explaining it, the gene products for HLA associate with intracellular recognition and help us decide what self and non-self. And this wouldn't be a problem until transplant came along. If they play a major role in determining whether or not transplanted tissue is accepted as self or rejected as foreign. The higher the match, the more likely it is accepted as self. The risk of graft failure, graft versus associated disease, mortality, they do increase in parallel with the number of HLA disparities or mismatches. So we try to find our, our best matches always. How many variations of proteins are there? Well, let me give you an example. I keep saying that there's these proteins A, B, 
uh, and DR that we focus on, there's lots of variation in there. In fact, there are 697 types of HLA-A proteins, and we just simply number them. There's HLA-1, HLA-A2, A3, A4, A500, and HLA-A697. Then there's 1,000 B proteins, 382 C proteins, and 603 DR proteins. If you looked at all different permutations of this, you could have potentially 1.4 times 10 to the 23rd unique genotypes, which is an amazingly high number of different combinations of proteins to make it a, an astoundingly high number of individuals. Does it actually work that way? Well, not quite. Luckily, this chromosome was inherited from parents as one big block. So you do get uh, families and regions that share the A, B, C, and D, R proteins together. And so we call that linkage. And the inheritance we call the haplotype. So a lot of times that it, a certain A will go along with a certain B, which will migrate along with a certain D protein. Um, so you don't actually have 10 to the 23rd combinations, but it's much more limited in that because of that. And that's because of, migration of migrations of populations, which for most of the scientific data started somewhere in Africa uh, thousands of years ago. But there are still a lot of combinations that we have to do our best uh, to match on these proteins. But these are the proteins that we're matching on. Um, so th the matching does depend on the donor source. Again, the siblings, so brother and sister, they're often going to be identical because of this block inheritance of HLA. So if you get uh, a copy from mom and a copy from dad, and we say that your brother is matched to you, well, they probably have the same copies that were inherited. So they're likely to be perfect matches. Um, there can be variations in the sibling outside of this MHC cluster, but we don't worry about those. Now again, unrelated people on the community, they're only tested at the HLA gene. So again, the big ones are the A, the B, the DR. Sometimes we'll go to the C, <clears throat> and sometimes other ones. And you can obviously have mismatches at some of the other parts of the MHC, but we don't worry about that. Uh, sometimes it's hard enough to match unrelated people just at A, B, and DR. And a lot of your matching depends on where you came from and your ethnicity. Likelihood of finding a matched unrelated donor is shown here. You can see if you are of white European descent on the far left, the odds of an 8 out of 8 match. Now this time we're talking about A, B, C, D, R, and D, Q. Uh, that, uh, that gives us our 8 out of 8. In fact, it's just A, B, C, and D, R. So that gives us our 8 out of 8 match. It's 70%. To get 7 out of 8, it's another... 20% uh, or so added on, which means 98% of white Europeans are going to have a pretty good matched unrelated donor. But you can see as your ethnicity changes, the odds of a perfect match fall off precipitously. Look at the other, at the right end, the native Alaskan. The odds of finding a perfect match are only 35%. To find a 7 out of 8 or 8 out of 8, the odds are just over 80%, which means 19% go unmatched. Um, let's go back to the left and look at um, African American, the third row, third column in, perfect match, 20% only. If you're looking for 7 of 8 or 8 out of 8 match, it only gets up to 75%. That means 25% of African Americans go unmatched. So when people ask me, what can I do about a donor drive, I always tell them, you know, this is where the real needs are, are in these other ethnic groups, African American, African, uh, and etc. cetera. Uh, many of the white Europeans, the matching is at a pretty high level and there are plenty of donors, but it's really in these other ethnic groups that we need to grow the NMDP. <clears throat> the diversity of adult donors in Be The Match, 56 are white, 26 are minority, and 18% are unknown. <clears throat> and so we really need to change that to include uh, 
more minority donors to help with that matching problem. Let's look at cord blood. Um, so the matching here is going to be a little different because we do it differently. We're talking about HOA A, B, D, R now. Six out of six matching for the white European on the left side. It's going to be about 10 to 15 percent. Cord blood is very permissive for, for mismatches, so we consider five out of six very similarly to a six out of six, um, and we can get up to 65 percent. Occasionally, we can do even four out of six uh, cord blood transplants, and we get up to 95 percent. So that tells, tells you that almost all white Europeans do have a, a, a uh, majority match cord blood unit available. Again, when we look at some of the minority populations, look at the African American, the odds of a perfect match are probably two or three percent. If you add five out of sixes, you only get up to twenty-three percent. And if you add four out of six on top of that, you get up to eighty percent. That means twenty percent go unmatched, uh, which is a problem. So again, for those people interested in donating cord blood to the general bank, um, I really try to encourage uh, many of the minority populations to donate cord blood and or marrow because that's where the real deficiency uh, lies uh, as far as a matching perspective. Uh, let's see, likelihood of finding an unrelated donor cord blood. This is uh, essentially this, this same data which I'm going to uh, skip and move on. So the diversity of the cord blood units, 44% are white, 56% are minority, 10% are unknown. So that's enough about matching. Uh, I know it's complicated, but uh, it's a topic that generates lots of questions. Let's talk about stem cells for just a minute here. We have lots of different names we call these cells. Sometimes we call them hematopoietic stem cells, sometimes progenitor cells. Sometimes we abbreviate it and call them HSC or HPC or we put them together and call it HSPC. For all intents and purposes, we're talking about the same thing when it comes to the transplant process. The stem cells are blood forming cells that can duplicate. They produce all the types of blood. The progenitors, they don't necessarily duplicate themselves, but they do produce all the different types of blood cells. And so we can, this is a very crude way of looking at HSCs. On the left side, they become progenitors, they then become blood cell precursors, and then they make blood. Um, we can break this pathway apart in fantastic detail. People have spent their whole careers describing different lineages and growth factors uh, in, from which you make your uh, mature blood cells. There are lots of different stages in between as well. So again, the sources will revisit there are, there are bone marrow, which is kind of the classic bone marrow transplant, uh, generally harvested under anesthesia by the child or adult donor. We use the kind of the, the tailbone, you might call it, on your backside. Uh, we take mul multiple, aspirates, multiple, multiple aspirates from the bilateral iliac crests. I often get asked, you know, am I full of puncture wounds? No, we use the same hole in the skin, but we may make different holes in the bone below the skin. Generally, you only have two holes in the skin. And we try to have a targeted dose of five times 10 to the eight nucleated cells per kilo recipient. There's another way of getting stem cells, peripheral blood stem cells, we call them. Throughout your body and in circulating your blood, there's actually a very, very low level of hematopoietic stem cells. We can expand those stem cells by giving a person granulocyte colony stimulant growth factor for four or five days. It's a, it's a, shot, a small shot delivered into the skin. It'll actually mobilize the stem, stem cells out of your bone marrow and into your blood. We can then collect you up to a machine that looks like a blood donor machine uh, and collect those stem cells out of your blood and actually return your blood to you. So then we have a bag of stem cells uh, which can be processed and or frozen. This type of transplant can be used with adult patients. We typically don't use this transplant for children because it is associated with higher rates of graft versus host disease. So um, there's hardly any institutions that use this in children. 
the final source is the umbilical cord blood transplant. In 1988, the first related cord transplant was between a brother and a sister for Franconi anemia. And then Dr. John Wagner uh, performed the first unrelated transplant, unrelated cord blood transplant in 1993 or so. <clears throat> in this case, the blood from the umbilical cord and placenta is squeezed out. It's a rich source of hematopoietic cells. Uh, and you basically just put it in a bag and uh, you put some anticoagulant in the bag and you freeze it. Again, we have a targeted cell dose. In this case, the targeted dose is a little bit lower. Uh, it's 2.5 to 3 times 10 to the 7th nucleated cells per kilo. Um, the dose is fixed. Whatever you get out of the cord blood is what you get. You can't go back to the donor again and ask more cells. Uh, despite the cell dose being a little lower, the cells are very robust and uh, have been used in, in thousands and thousands of successful transplants. The cord blood can be saved for years and years and years. And I've seen cord blood saved for over 20 years. And under the right conditions, it's equally as potent as if it were saved for just a week. So the, as I mentioned before, cord blood is a little bit more permissive uh, for matching. So we typically consider 4 out of 6, 5 out of 6, and 6 out of 6 cord bloods. Uh, 6 out of 6 still do better than the 5 out of 6, which still do better than the 4 out of 6. Um, what we've discovered here in Minnesota is that the more mismatches you have, uh, the higher the cell dose you need. So we actually have a fairly complicated algorithm when we pick cord blood or we pick uh, unrelated donors. Uh, and the algorithm includes the matching and it also includes the cell dose, which is per weight of the recipient. And we take all those things in consideration when we figure out what is going to be the best uh, stem cell source for a person's disease. We also take the disease into consideration because in diseases such as leukemia, sometimes you need to move very quickly in getting your transplant done. Um, and sometimes cord blood actually provides that purpose since the cord blood is sitting in a freezer somewhere in the country and we just need to fly it here and infuse it. So speed to transplant plays a role in our decision making as well. The relapse rates are similar to other sources for cord blood. Uh, Graffers' leukemia effect is likely as robust between cord blood and marrow. The transplant itself for other diseases between cord blood and marrow is also as likely as robust. So we're an institution where we do a lot of cord blood transplants as well as, as donor uh, transplants. There are new things coming down the pike. Uh, as you'll see, there are ex vivo expansion strategies that we're trying to pioneer. We're using cytokines to expand cord blood to greater and greater cell doses. Uh, you can co-culture cord blood with other cells to expand them. We can use drugs to expand them, small molecules to expand them. So we're trying to take them from lowish cell doses to much higher cell doses through these expansion technologies. Uh, much of the data, is, I would say several of the clinical trials are published. The expansion technologies look like they are robust. Uh, the core blood units look like they graft with equal efficacy, if not improved efficacy after expansion. Whether or not they control the disease uh, after engraftment as well, uh, it yet is to be determined. This lists the advantages and disadvantages of various sources, uh, including uh, bone marrow core blood and peripheral blood stem cells. As I told you, bone marrow is the traditional source, has good engraftment, predictable engraftment. If you have a failed bone marrow transplant, you can sometimes go back to the donor if you need to. Peripheral blood, stem cells, there's a rapid time to engraftment. You can go back to the donor if you need to. Cord blood, no risk to the donor because you just basically save the cord blood in the freezer. It's rapidly available. The bank is larger than the marrow bank. It's eth more ethically diverse, actually. We can store it for many years. Uh, there's limited GBH activity, both acute and chronic compared to marrow. And there's probably a lower infectious risk as babies are generally EBV and CV negative uh, when they're born. And as I mentioned, naturally mismatch is more acceptable. So those are the advantages. The disadvantages, bone marrow, there's, a, there's always a risk of anesthesia and our discomfort to the donor. 
There's a lack of HLA match donors in some ethnic categories. There could be a longer wait time for the match donor related donor. There's a risk of GVHD, depending on where you're being transferred from, I would say, 20% to 60%. Peripheral blood stem cells have a higher rate of GBHD. We don't perform these in children. There's, a, again, lack of HLA donors. There might be a longer wait time. Disadvantages of cord blood, limited by the size of the unit. What you get out of the cord is what you get. Uh, you can't get more. There's uh, sometimes a little longer time to engraftment. Uh, you're unable to use the donor, again, uh, in most cases. Uh, there's for most centers, they have less experience with cord blood as it's a relatively new modality of transplant. <clears throat> and I suppose there's a theoretical risk of transmission of genetic diseases um, which may not be diagnosed to a child. Suppose a child uh, donates a cord blood, but then for whatever reason the child gets leukemia at age seven. Well, and then I'm talking about the donor gets leukemia at age seven. Well, was that leukemia present in his cord blood? I don't know, but uh, these are the things people talk about. Uh, there's certainly a theoretical possibility of that. And there could be other diseases as well that aren't tested for on the cord blood that there's this risk of transmission, but it's exceedingly rare. Um, conditioning. So let's talk about the chemotherapy. The goals are to eradicate, eradicate leukemia cancer cells in the cases of children with cancer. We also, the goal is also to ablate the marrow to create space for the donor cells. We want to suppress the recipient's immune system so we don't reject the cord blood or marrow. And then uh, we also want to augment the anti-tumor response in the case of malignancy. Now, as I mentioned, historically, we use total body irradiation and chemotherapy. And most of the non-malignant diseases like Hurler syndrome and adrenal dystrophy, we no longer use radiation um, because we basically don't need to. We can rely more on chemotherapy and spare the child from radiation effects. Uh, there are, and again, we, we try not to radiate young children. In the case of autologous transplant, we usually don't radiation. Kids that got radiation for their cancer, we try not to read them again. And finally, in the non-malignant diseases like ALD and Hurler syndrome, we don't use radiation. So what do we use for chemo? We use busulfan, uh, generally IV. It's an alkylator. It's pretty potent in chemo. Its main side effect is seizures, though I haven't seen one now for many years. Uh, sometimes venoclusive disease, which is a problem with the liver post-transplant, and it causes breakdown of uricus membranes. We also use cyclophosphamide as another traditional agent, another alkylator. It's immunosuppressive. It's not fully myeloblative by itself, which is why we mix it with busulfan. There can be some uh, cardiac toxicity associated with this. There can be electrolyte abnormalities, kidney injury, etc. We use, we occasionally provide uh, combined fludarabine in, which is an anti-metabolite immunosuppressive may have neurotoxicity, rash, mucositis, um, et cetera. Some institutions use malphalan, again, an alkylator, typically used in solid tumors. Occasionally, some non-malignant protocols use it. On the grand scheme, I'm always asked about toxicity. Essentially, a myeloblative transplants in the upper right-hand corner, we have no myeloblative transplants. The more chemotherapy you get, the less likely your marrow is going to grow back. That's myeloblative therapy. If we hardly gave you any chemotherapy, your marrow, your own marrow is very likely to come back. That's non-ablative. In the middle of this is a new type of conditioning called reduced intensity conditioning. There's no other accepted definition uh, for it, but it's kind of a middle ground be between complete ablation and non-ablation. And what mixture of drugs you use is really uh, institution dependent. And so you want to ablate somebody, but you don't want you do want to spare them from all the side effects. Um, but again, if you don't ablate them enough, they're going to reject the transplant. And finding that happy medium is very important. And you have the and is uh, depends a lot on the the expertise at the center. Uh, this is what I just said. The myeloblative conditioning uh, is the most immunosuppressive with the highest doses of chemo. Uh, 
via more side effects. Reduced intensity is in the middle. And I'll just go to the next slide. Non-mild layer conditioning is what we might consider the lightest in terms of chemotherapy, lower doses of TBI, fludarabine is often added, it's immunosuppressive, uh, but again, you may reject the graph or you could end up with a mixed graph, so part uh, original host and part donor, which occasionally happens. The other topic I get asked questions about is chimerism, so that's where you tell the donor from the recipient. This is generally performed on the peripheral blood or on the bone marrow. <clears throat> and we have molecular ways in the lab to tell how much of the donor's marrow has engrafted in the patient. And we use genetic markers to do that. We report it out as percent donor. So somebody may start at 60% donor in the peripheral blood, they go up to 70% donor, 80%, and then 100% donor. Obviously, if they're 60% donor, the other part of their cells is recipient. So they're 60% donor, 40% recipient, or 40% self. As they climb in engraftment up to 80% donor, then they're only 20% self. And ultimately, the goal is generally 100% donor with no recipient cells left. We usually look at subpopulations in cells like the monocytes and the peripheral blood, and sometimes the T cells. Uh, and these engraft differently, so you don't have the same percentage donor, actually. You may be 100% mon donor monocyte, but only 20% donor CD3. And that's because of the nature of the cells and uh, how your thymus and spleen interacts with donor cells to cause expand and beyond the focus of this talk. Generally, we focus a lot on the monocyte engraft. So what about adrenal leukodystrophy? What is the history of transplant? Well, going back, the rationale was that lysosomal diseases like metachromatic leukodystrophy had success in ameliorating symptoms and reversing the storage lesion uh, and enzyme deficiency uh, in MLD. Uh, this was pre-1984, this would have been in the 1970s. ALD was known to be a paroxysomal disease, but it was not known if it was an enzyme deficiency. So in 84, Mosier and others reported the first transplant for an advanced ALD patient who actually progressed and died uh, post-transplant. And then it took a number of years. Uh, Patrick Auber Auberg uh, reported a patient with early disease. And lo and behold, we got stabilization of the disease uh, was achieved um, and very long chain fatty acid with which most of you probably know about, they actually decreased, though they weren't quite normal. And so this was the first uh, real success in the disease. And in 1993, Albert uh, cloned the gene in this lab, and it turned out that the it was not an enzyme deficiency that we are correcting, but a transmembrane non-secreted protein. Uh, and transplant is now standard of care for early cerebral disease, but how is it working to correct this transmembrane non-secreted protein? It's not like an enzyme that we're replacing. Well, here's the ideas that we think are going on. We believe it stops cerebral, the cerebral inflammatory process by, go, by replacing the diseased cells in the brain. You're not giving a deficient enzyme, but you're probably replacing the microglia cells in the brain with donor microglia, which will have the corrected gene. And they probably function to clean up a lot of the inflammation in the brain, and they may very well re reduce very long chain fatty acid levels or other inflammatory levels in the brain that contribute to the disease. Is it doing anything to disease oligodendrocytes in the brain? No, I don't think it is, because that oligodendrocytes and other glial cells are not provided in the transplant. The only thing we think really is provided is microglial cells. And this is, this is really based on mouse data, and there's not a whole lot of human data to support that, so, so there's a lot of theory behind it. But nevertheless, the donor microglia, or perhaps other immune cells, provide protection for the uh, remaining oligodendrocyte population uh, that, for all intents and purposes, still has ABC1 mutation and lacks the ALD protein. <clears throat> 
So some more about ALD. This is the classic MRI showing T2 weighted image damage here in the posterior part of the brain. So all this white area shouldn't be here. It should lo look like the frontal part here. So uh, that indicates damage. But then if you give the patient contrast, in this case gadolinium, gadolinium will, fl will flow to areas of inflammation. And if your blood-brain barrier is broken, it actually flows to that area where it's broken. And classically, we see this ring of contrast enhancement where we think the leading edge of all the damage is going on. Uh, associated with this ring of contract is contrast enhancement is in are, in fact, immune cells. You will find B cells, T cells, monocytes in the brains of individuals uh, at the time of diagnosis along this ring. And so getting rid of this ring of enhancement is a, is a paramount goal after transplant. We have methods of scoring the amount of damage through the less scoring system, which is basically quantifying this damage area in white with a numeric system. So it allows us not just to say there's a lot of white matter damage, but to put a number on it and quantify it. So what's the goal of BMT? So again, you have this, this demyelination, this white matter disease here in the back part of the brain. You have this ring of inflammation. Here is a patient 28 days post-transplant. You notice the amount of damage in his myelin has not changed, and this generally does not change for ALD after transplant. Uh, the damage you have is the damage you have. But you can see the ring of inflammation almost completely gone. And fundamentally, when I think about transplant for ALD, this is often what we're trying to achieve, uh, is to take that inflammation and remove it. And, and this is all true from, it, from an MRI and imaging point of view. <clears throat> now, what is the data in regards for outcomes for transplant for ALD? Well, we can look at transplant for early ALD versus no therapy. Uh, this is a, a Lancet paper for, by Mahmoud et al. It's a great paper, uh, reference frequency, that we learned if you don't transplant for early ALD, your probability of survival drops off precipitously versus those that are transplanted for ALD probability of survival is extremely high. So then we know what happens uh, in ALD if you don't provide transplant. It just essentially follows its natural uh, history. Um, what else can I add to that? Uh, uh, the next slide I'm going to show you is going to be transplant based on less score. The data in that study were collected from 43 centers of 94 patients. There are lots of regimens available. There's lots of different levels of engraftment that I'm not going to go into. Uh, the leading cause of death is disease progression. Let's look at the outcomes after transplant based on the MRI score. Uh, and this was published by Charlie Peters in 2004. Those children with an MRI score now this is the less score, the MRS score less than 9, typically had much better outcomes as a probability of survival versus those with an MRI score greater than 9. So if your less score is 10 or higher, the outcomes are much more inferior. Now this is more of a historic study, so this is reported in 2004. We're now in 2017, so we're 13 years later. We've actually risk adapted many of these patients to provide those with a less score different types of transplant, different types of conditioning, and have, we've been able to bring this survival level uh, up to a much higher level. So an updated in 2011, uh, what is the survival of uh, patients with ALD after transplant? Looking at all patients, uh, it's close to 80%, like 76% is the exact number. Again, let's look at less score. Again, in agreement with the prior data, the less score, less than 10, 90 to 95% overall survival. Those with the less score greater than 10, inferior 60 uh, or so uh, percent survival long term. Number one cause 
after transplant, uh, death would be disease progression. You can see these individuals here are one and two years after transplant. So that's why we, our best patients are those with low less scores and minimal uh, loss of function. We can look at um, early, if we look at patients with low less scores and we look at the type of donor, uh, the sibling donor is still preferred um, versus the unrelated donor, which seemed to do a little worse, but this was not statistically significant. In a transplanter's mind, we would call these pretty much equal because the p-value is not less than 0.05, uh, though in reality, this, the unrelated donors did uh, tend to do a little bit more inferior. There's also a way to uh, quantify neurologic function for ALD. This is the mosier raymond scale. You get a point for every loss in a category. So if a child has hearing processing problems, they get a point. Loss of communication, three points. If they have difficulty swallowing, two points. Cortical blindness, two points. Wheelchair, two points. On and on and on. So uh, the total number here is 25 points. If you have zero points, you're essentially neurologically intact and doing well. <clears throat> so let's look at the change in neurologic function one year post-transplant between uh, patients with different MRI scores. So again, those with a less score of less than 10 typically have very, uh, gained very few points. That is, they lost minimal ground post-transplant. Those patients that come in with high less scores typically lose a lot more ground after transplant, anywhere from 5 to 20 points. And of course, if we go back to the scale, you can see that gaining these points is not good. If you go from just processing problems to wheelchair to spastic to tube feeding, that's a different quality of life than just gaining a point or two. This emphasizes the real need for identification of this disease early and MRI screening because we want, we want our patients to come in with low less scores. Um, and that's the bottom line. Um, so the lessons we've learned is that we're really, thus far we're unable to predict the phenotype of disease for anybody with ALD because as you know only probably half of the boys with ALD end up developing the cerebral form and have to come to transplant. Transplantation is still indicated for those with cerebral disease. If the boys are identified early, the outcomes are more favorable than, the, favorable than those identified late. Um, most patients presenting are due to neurologic symptoms until they have been a newborn screening, which is coming online now in some states. Still, I'm seeing boys every week with very advanced disease. I'd say I've seen four boys in the last month with very advanced disease. Uh, we can't offer transplant because they're so advanced. Can we modify transplant? Well, I'll just touch briefly on one modification. In 2005, Powers et al. reported evidence of oxidative stress in autopsies of patients with ALD. Aurora Peugeot in Spain has documented a lot of evidence of increased oxidative stress in ABCD1 knockout mouse. And so we have performed uh, a variety of uh, in vitro studies uh, as well as other labs around the world on a drug called N-acetylcysteine, which is a non-toxic compound. It's used in the treatment uh, for overdoses of acetaminophen. And it's emitted, administered IV and orally. There's almost no toxicity, penetrates the CNS. It's a very potent antioxidant. Uh, it increases various antioxidant enzymes and provides you with a source of glutathione. If you look at cell lines from ALD patients, 1, 2, and 3 versus uh, normal patients, and stress them with a drug called acrolein, shown in the red bar, and then measure reaction, reactive oxygen species, they're very high. When you treat the cell lines with N-acetylcysteine, the green bars, that oxidative stress goes way down. And even in the control patient, uh, that oxidative stress goes way down. This is also true in oligodendrocytes. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this side, but move on to really what I'm, the point I'm trying to get at is, could antioxidant therapy improve outcomes for those with cerebral LD? Well, it turns out if you transplant boys with high less score greater than 10, 
This is your survival curve. If you don't give them N-acetylcysteine, this is your survival curve if you do. So, yes, you can modify the transplant outcome in terms of survival if you put them on N-acetylcysteine. So now most centers believe this drug does play a role in modification of the disease, and we do put uh, most boys on it. Uh, and again, fully, these are looking at just a boys with fully ablative regimen, very advanced ALD, less course greater than 14, survival is 100% with N-acetylcysteine, and very poor without N-acetylcysteine. This does not say anything about symptomatology or quality of life. It's purely survival. Conclusions are we can't predict who's at risk for cerebral disease once again. We have good outcomes with standard transplant for advanced disease. We have poor outcomes. Um, if they're very advanced, we actually don't have any other therapy for boys. We do provide reduced intensity to regimens and NLCL cysteine to modulate the disease in some boys that we believe are higher risk. That is a less score grade 10 or greater. And cysteine alone is insufficient as a neuroprotectant. And as we continue to study the physiology of the disease and other drugs and antioxidants, um, hopefully we'll be better at this. So we uh, have a, somewhat of an algorithm for transplant at our institution. We verify boys that have adrenal epidystrophy. Uh, we look from MRI evidence, demyelination, and inflammation. Less score, we measure the less score if it's less than 10. We can usually proceed to a mild blade of transplant protocol with n acetylcysteine. If they're greater than 10, we employ a reduced transplant protocol with n acetylcysteine. All right, I've talked probably about 55 minutes or so. I'm going to actually skip this section on biomarkers and I'll see if there are. Um, questions out there. I do need to show the disclaimer slide again. Um, that uh, the information that this is for informational purposes only. Uh, it's not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis or treatment. If you're ill or a family member is ill, you should seek professional medical attention immediately. LD Connect does not recommend or endorse any specific physicians, treatments, procedures, products, even though we mentioned them on the site. Uh, and that the participation in the webinar is completely voluntary and the webinar will be recorded and available for rebroadcast at any time. So I will see if there are questions out there um, from people viewing this. Let's see, I have to drag my window. All right, question one. Uh, what is the best current percentage for successful BMT assuming a timely diagnosis and treatment in childhood ALD? What constitutes success? This is uh, a very common question. Success is defined by lots of different ways. Um, in the latter part of this talk, all I told you about was survival. So this comes from transplants for children with leukemia because that was the number one priority was getting the child to survive. In ALD, while we can show graphs on survival, it's more than survival. What I, my goal as a transplanter in trying to be successful is survival with the best quality of life and the most minimal loss of neurologic function and damage on MRI. I think that's the best way to quantify success now for ALD uh, bone marrow transplants. Uh, question two. I recently heard that mortality rate for adult men who get BMT procedure as high as 40%. Is it true and why? Um, yeah, I think that is fairly accurate. It's not just adult men for BMT. I would say it's adults in general actually have a doubling or higher increase in mortality after transplant, and that's all diseases, cancer, lymphoma, ALD, it doesn't matter. It's because adults just don't do as well with the chemotherapy. The adults have poor organ function. If you're 50, you your organs function a lot differently than when you were 10. 
You also have exposed yourself probably to toxins, maybe smoking, maybe drinking alcohol. You also carry more infections uh, when you're older than when you're younger. That explains most of the increased mortality after transplant for adult persons. Question three, how many doses of N-acetylcysteine do you use during transplantation? Uh, the dosing is typically uh, two to four times a day. Classically, it's four times a day. Um, if a child's taking oral N-acetylcysteine, it's really a handful of pills and they don't get uh, they, they can't take it four times a day. So if they're an outpatient, I just encourage them to take it as much as possible, whether it's twice a day or three times a day. But classically, it's a drug to be given every six hours. If you're doing it IV, of course, you have more control over that. You can do it um, four times a day. That's question four, if a young boy cannot find a match or will benefit from or will benefit from bone marrow transplant, then how effective is gene therapy? It's an excellent question. Um, I think for this webinar, um, I limited the talk really to talk about bone marrow transplant, the mythical matching, the stem cell sources, and the historic perspective and, and data on ALD as I know it. Uh, I didn't talk about gene therapy intentionally because Florian Eichler is planning to give uh, a webinar on uh, the gene therapy trial um, for ALD. And that, could happen in the next month, uh, at least in my discussions with them, is that I would give this webinar on just the fundamentals of transplant and then he would provide an update on gene therapy. Question five, could you expand more on transplant for LD? How would this transplant affect children at a younger age like Lorenzo from Lorenzo's oil? <clears throat> uh, another good question. Will transplant protect you from cerebral disease? Do I transplant children that don't have cerebral disease? Uh, the first answer is I don't know, and the second is uh, I, we don't you, we don't transplant unless you have cerebral disease. So if you were a boy identified on a newborn screen with LD disease, I would not take you to transplant uh, at this point in time. Um, it's only after you develop cerebral disease. Um, there are two reasons why that is. One, um, remember only half or less than half of the boys with ALD will develop cerebral disease. So if you transplant everybody, you could be transplanting six boys out of ten that will never have cerebral disease. And you would be putting through chemotherapy and transplant for no reason. Um, Transplant, even though in some graphs I showed 100% survival, is not without risk. If you have the best match uh, to be a 4 out of 6 core blood or 7 out of 8 donor, that comes with a real risk. So again, if that's the best match to a newborn who's been picked up on a newborn screen, I would not take that child to transplant because of the risk. So we typically assess boys that are early in disease and show evidence on the MRI of uh, demyelination and inflammation. Uh, and this is the same for, true for adults, too. We met as a group a number of years ago at a meeting and decided for adults interested in transplant, we would only take those adults with evidence of cerebral disease uh, because of the risks of transplant. Question six, do I have information on if and when gene therapy is opening up? Unfortunately, I do not have information on that. Uh, question seven, uh, is seven out of eight considered the best match? Uh, no. Eight out of eight would be the best match. Seven out of eight uh, is, is basically the runner-up. Now, for, for many donors, I mean, when we do these searches, we get back from the NMDP the matching, and so there may be no 8 out of 8 matches in the United States for a particular patient. And so then, if there are no 8 out of 8 matches, you go to the next level because you are, after all, looking for some stem cell source. Um, and so many times it is 7 out of 8. Uh, and I actually have no problem using a 7 out of 8 uh, donor uh, as a stem cell source uh, as they there's 
slightly more increased risk of graft rejection and GBH, uh, but generally uh, I find it to be an acceptable donor. When you start going down to six out of eight, that's kind of where the invisible line is drawn. Uh, if we find a six out of eight donor, we don't consider that person to be a donor. Uh, and I can't think of any cases where we would, uh, at least not in terms of adrenal leakage dystrophy. But we will commonly use seven out of eight and eight out of eight unrelated marrow donors. And that looks like that's, well, one more question it looks like. And then the other thing that often gets very confusing is the cord blood matching and the marrow matching. They're, they're different levels of matching. They include some of the same proteins, but often we talk about eight matches or ten matches in marrow, and we only talk about six matches in cord blood. And that's just historically how it's performed, uh, but it does lead to a lot of confusion when talking about it with patients. Um, question eight, uh, male ALD patient MRIs for the last five years, no signs of cerebral involvement. Uh, that's fantastic. Can you recommend therapies, drugs, treatments, or habits that improve my chances of not developing it in the future? This question comes up. Uh, Dr. Jerry Raymond and I have long discussions about this on what uh, we recommend to patients. Uh, I'm currently not involved in any of the clinical trials for men with AMN or men with ALD, uh, so I don't recommend, I, I can't recommend any of the drugs that are being used. I do get asked about N-acetylcysteine and antioxidants a lot, and I'm in full favor of them uh, for those with ALD. I have no problem telling somebody that they can go to GNC, you can get N-acetylcysteine, you can take the pills, they're non-toxic, it's, it's very hard to overdose on it. Uh, you have to take it, well, classically four times a day, but if you take it twice a day, so fine. Why do I say that? Given all the data in transplant and in in vitro models, N-acetylcysteine is doing something to modulate the, the disease. I'm not sure exactly what it's doing, uh, but it is providing some effect. And so often I get questions from families that I can't bring to transplant and from adults, what can I do if anything? And I, uh, I think that's a, a fine and safe thing to do is, is to take N-acetylcysteine, which again, you can buy anywhere over the counter. Uh, it smells terrible, by the way, but uh, that's, that's the one thing I, I say. For any other therapies, immunosuppression or anything like that, you need to be seen by a, a transplanter with experience in ALD. Let's, there's another question, is the goal of cord blood stem cell transplant to insert the missing gene or to replace the destroyed brain cells? I think with, uh, trans, with the cord blood transplant, we're still replacing the cells. Uh, still, yeah, I, I don't think we're trying to insert the missing gene. We are replacing the destroyed brain cells, but it's not the neurons and it's not the oligodendrocytes, it's really just the microglia cells that we're replacing uh, with cord blood transplant. But it's not just cord blood, we believe marrow does the same thing as a cord blood transplant. Along, this, along with that, my personal opinion is that we're also changing the immune system. I think the immune system has a lot to do with the disease manifestation and when you replace the person's person with ALD's immune system with a new one, I think that contributes to disease modification as well. Um, again, that's my personal opinion. Uh, there's another question. So is a patient susceptible to graft resistance disease with seven out of eight uh, match? Absolutely. Even if you're eight out of eight matched, you're susceptible to graft resistance disease. In fact, even if you're a sibling transplant, if you're getting marrow from a brother or sister, there's still a risk of graft versus disease. And that's because there are minor mismatches that we don't measure. And so, again, the best match is a brother or sister. Then you go to eight out of eight unrelated donor. It does carry a risk of graft versus disease. Then you go to a seven out of eight, which carries a little bit more risk. 
So these risks stack upon each other. You go to six out of eight, it's higher. Five out of eight, it's higher. Yeah, four out of eight is only half match. That would be the highest. Um, and the same is true for cord blood. We don't, they're different stem cell sources, so we went over the advantages and disadvantages uh, to each. But you start out as six out of six. That has a risk of graft resistance to disease. Five out of six does well. There might be a, a bit, a tiny bit more risk, though they do really perform as, as well as a six out of six, perhaps. But then you get to a four out of six, and there's going to be more risk there. Um, again, when choosing a donor between marrow or cord blood, we don't just rely on match. There are other variables. Cell dose variable plays a role for sure. Time to transplant plays a role for sure. Um, we have a complicated algorithm. We also check antibodies in the patient. Uh, and patients may have antibodies to HLA proteins that we assess. For those that you've been worked up for transplant, it's a PRA test. When we send that test out to you, we're actually looking for antibodies to a potential stem cell source. Uh, and that plays a role in our algorithm. Uh, so sometimes we might choose one product or, or over another, but it does depend on, on all these different variables. Um, what is the correlation between Lorenzo's oil and transplants on ALD patients? Well, that's a good question. I uh, don't know if I know the answer to that one. Um, what I can, you know, the the Lorenzo, Lorenzo, Lorenzo's oil is still available and has been studied and published by Dr. Raymond. It does seem to perhaps modify the timing of cerebral disease in, in that it may occur later in life. I, I can tell you that if you already have cerebral disease, Lorenzo's oil is of no benefit to you. Um, for, for, for adults, I think it's a wide open question. Uh, it actually would be a good question for Dr. Raymond to answer because I actually don't know the answer. Combining Lorenzo's oil and transplant, I think it's a, it's a great question. I, I don't know, again, that specific uh, answer. Is there a role of cyclosporins or other anti-rejection meds with the antioxidants post-transplant ALD? Yes, there is a role. Uh, I didn't mention it, but most of our protocols use cyclosporin up to 100 days and sometimes 180 days post-transplant uh, to control GBHD. All patients, well, most patients are then tapered off cyclosporin at that time. And that's to control graft rejection. Um, you don't necessarily want to be on cyclosporin uh, if, you have, if you can avoid it for your entire life because it is immunosuppressant and there are side effects to it. Uh, so after transplant, we, again, we do try to taper patients off their cyclosporin. All right, and now it looks like uh, that was the last question. So thanks for joining in the webinar and watching, and thanks for your questions.